There we go. Hello um, from Australia. Uh, it's really cool to be here. I was um, thinking about the theme broken. Um, in the context of motivation, uh, my background's in motivation science, and uh, the world of motivation science, I find, is overly fraught with um, a very extroverted alpha males with big teeth that talk about horrendous concepts like big, hairy, audacious goals and firm, throbbing targets and if you're inclined towards introversion, as I am, um, it's a little bit disconcerting. Um, you might have seen me, I was floating around there, I'm actually probably one of the most introverted motivational speakers um, on the planet. Um, I have all sorts of strategies to avoid networking with people. Um, <laughs> I, I do these things at networking events where I'll... Um, um, has, anyone, has anyone heard of Aikido before? I could say, oh, okay, damn, all right, well, I can't pretend like I know too much about it, but there is this thing, this is a martial arts where if you're going to get attacked, um, well, it's, it's, sorry, if someone's attacking you, you, you don't try to hurt them. Aikido is really beautiful, you just redirect the energy. And I do that with networking events, so, um, you know, I'll be walking around and stuff, and I'll see someone, like, trying to approach me. And I'll just, you know, redirect the energy and walk away. And if you, if you, if you walk confidently, um, you can kind of ping pong about the room, and um, people think you're important, and you don't necessarily need to speak to anyone. I and mean, that's lovely. <laughs> but it's not necessarily helpful. Occasionally, um, you accidentally make eye contact with someone, and I do this thing. Uh, I don't know if you do this thing. I'm sure. Are there any introverts in the room? Just put up your hand. Yeah, so hardcore introverts don't put up their hand, do they? <laughs> they, they just glance at you and resume judging you. Um, and that's fine. Some of the extroverts put up their hand because they love the attention. Um, I, do, I do this thing where... Um, you know how sometimes you're like, oh, great, I'm, I'm, you know, someone starts speaking to you and you're like, oh, okay, this, this sounds like a boring conversation. And then you invent a better conversation in your head while you're giving the outward you know, sense that you're actually listening. Um, I have these trigger words in my world. Um, if anyone says the word literally, I will literally think about what they're saying in the literal sense. So um, someone says, ha, that is so funny, I literally peed my pants. I cannot help but... I'm not, not sure that you did. Um, and then start thinking about why they're telling me this, uh, why they think it's a useful strategy to declare spontaneous incontinence with an otherwise stranger. The point of all this is I find, motiva or I find humans and behavior kind of weird in a fascinating way. And I tend to look at this from this curious scientific perspective uh, because I think it opens up some new avenues and how we can influence behavior at work, how we can design for the future of work, how we can build for more creativity in the way that we do our work. And when it comes to motivation though, a lot of our fixed perspectives of it are fairly broken. Um, my first encounter with a motivational speaker was when I was in high school. Um, uh, it was a, I grew up in Western Australia, down in the Southern Hemisphere, and um, I'm now thoroughly in hipster eyes in Melbourne uh, with pocket squares and stuff. I blend in quite well here in Stockholm. Um, there was, it was a 43 degree day, so 43 degrees Celsius, and there was a, there was a guy in a pinstripe suit on uh, where the whole school was sitting on the gymnasium room floor. Teachers were in their plastic chairs on the sidelines, and there was this guy sweating over his collar, and this is how he started his session. You all need to check up from the neck up. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Because right now, I see a whole bunch of amazing people. Okay. But you don't realize how amazing you are. Okay. You don't realize how amazing you are because in order to be amazing, you need to be amazing. Okay? You need to be amazing. The moment you realize that you don't have to become a millionaire, 
you already are a millionaire whose money just has not been deposited in the bank account yet, okay? That is the day. Okay, so you repeat after me. Conceive, believe, achieve, okay? Conceive, <laughs> believe, achieve. Anyway, um, he got us all fist pumping and stuff, and, and that was nice. Um, I just coughed the words bullshit into my head. Not really. I was, um, grew up with red, growing up with red hair in Australia is character building. There was a cool kid near me that said that. But um, I'm more of a mummy's boy. But the, the thing is, um, by the end of the presentation, it had an effect. We were pumped. We were motivated. We were enthused. And this, this kind of motivation lasted all the way through till lunchtime. And then things reverted back to as they were before. And I find that a lot of the stuff, a lot of the fluff and folklore that we read about motivation out there it's good at generating an effect, but then we quickly return to our established defaults. And one of the things that we have is default thinking, which leads to the inevitable Kraken of Doom. I'll talk about the Kraken of Doom in, in a moment. But this default thinking thing is really, um, it's really important. All of us have our defaults. Um, if you think about... Um, if you're at a cafe and you catch up with a friend, um, I was, we were at Snickerbucken Snicker recently, that was a cool cafe. There's some Cafe Pascal is really cool here as well. Good, good coffee going on. But if you're catching up with a friend and you get into conversation really quickly, you kind of have a default coffee order. So if someone comes to your table and says, what would you like to drink? You know, some people are chai lattes, some people are... Um, you know, flat whites, cortados. Uh, in, in Melbourne, we have something called a magic, which is a double ristretto three-quarter flat white, which is, which is magic. Um, and so you have these defaults that we go to. Our defaults are the options we choose automatically in the absence of viable alternatives. Our defaults are, are options we choose automatically in the absence of viable alternatives. And it's good that we have defaults. They save us a heap of time. Um, if you look at a young child, does anyone have a kid here, one to two years old? Or, or yep, okay, good. Oh, oh yeah, yes, but it <laughs> definitely does. Um, there's this thing that happens. You give them an object, uh, put an uh, object in a kid's hand, and they'll throw it down eventually on the ground. You pick it up and you'll give it back to them, and they'll throw it down again. Uh, you give it back to them again, and they'll throw it down again. And they think it's hilarious. It's, it's not really, especially if you don't have kids. But um, <laughs> But there's this thing that's happening, is they're observing a repeatable phenomena. So they're observing a pattern, and they're codifying that information in their brain, which they can use as a cognitive shortcut in the future, should they see a similar pattern manifest. So what that means is, the more we repeatably observe things, the more we see things time after time again, the more we build these cognitive shortcuts in our brain, which means that we can think pretty quickly. We have defaults in our mind. If you think about what you want to have for dinner tonight, and and if you were to be running late and you haven't had time to make anything at home and you need to pick something up, you have the de defaults. Now, in business, uh, anyone in the business, the more experience we have, the more we establish these defaults, these kind of these reliable patterns that we can go to. We have systems, policies, rules, templates, guidelines. When it comes to thinking about something new in business, you don't always have to start with a blank piece of paper. You have these wonderful defaults, which save you a whole heap of time and cognitive angst, except when they get in the way of things. And what we have at the moment is a combination of broken approaches to motivation, uh, along with this curse of efficiency. Businesses at the moment, a lot of us, are cursed with efficiency. We've become so good at finding these and leveraging these defaults that it's getting in the way of our time for slower, more deliberate, more creative thinking. And the result of this is that when we have a whole heap of defaults happening, we start to see this happening. This is the typical arc of enterprise growth. Every business starts at a startup phase, and in the startup phase, the thing that's of most value here is new thinking. This new thinking, this, this creative thinking, this disruptive thinking, that's where all the value is. Now, if we're, if we're clever, we might be able to see growth happen. Many startups don't get to this point because their new thinking doesn't meet a market value, but some do, and some large organizations are trying to tap into this type of new thinking uh, by creating these embedded startup hubs and uh, these entrepreneurial hubs or labs within their organizations. If we get to the growth phase, an interesting thing happens here. Between growth and maturity, this is where we start to see the death of empathy, no, the death of curiosity. This is where curiosity begins to die because at this point, you have a raft of evidence that suggests what you're currently doing is working. 
By this point, you have established defaults that are much more efficient to refer to than it is to engage in new or creative thinking. And so what happens is we rely on these defaults and then it gets to a point of maturity where we have well-established systems, ways of doing things, patterns of behavior. And that leads to, thus then to the death of empathy. We're so used to doing what we do that we forget to empathize with the emerging needs of the world, of our clients, of the people we're looking after. And that leads us swiftly to the inevitable kraken of doom. Um, krakens being you know, mythical sea beasts that swallow ships. Um, no one sets out to become irrelevant, but many of us find ourselves there when we become too busy for meaningful progress. The kraken feeds upon the sweet nectar of our impending irrelevance. And the typical approach that many of us take when it comes to avoiding the kraken is to elongate this, this kind of plateau between maturity and decline. This is where businesses, where individuals, we seek out more and more efficiencies, more efficient ways of doing things, but that only delays the inevitable. The only way that we can circumvent the inevitable kraken of doom is by embarking upon new growth arcs, which means tapping into a new type of thinking. It means going back to like the startup type of thinking and no matter where we are in the growth arc, which means we need to creatively think. We need to be able to engage in that type of talent. But motivating for this is very hard. A lot of the motivation stuff out there is very good for formulaic work with predictable outcomes. So if it's been done before, you can set a goal for it. Um, there's, a, there's a great term in academia called constructive discontent. I really like this term. I've got a model that I, I whipped up on in Keynote for us. Constructive discontent recognizes that there is a discrepancy between our current state and our desired future state. We want this type of constructive discontent. It's okay to feel content every now and then. I um, once experienced about um, six consecutive seconds of happiness, and that was lovely. But if we're content for too long, that can lead to comfort, which can lead to complacency, which can lead to decline into the inevitable kraken of doom and irrelevance. We want to be blessed with dissatisfaction. We want to be able to look at what we're doing and realize, you know what, we can be doing even better. There's more that we can be doing here. There's more that we can strive for. And this constructive discontent is really, really useful. I am. Um, the typical approaches to motivation, though, are to go inside people's heads and hearts. And I should point out, I've had business coaching in my life that's been absolutely transformational, it's been wonderful, it can be incredible. It can also be incredibly lame. Um, anyone can go out and get business cards printed with butterflies on them because butterflies symbolize transformation and that's lovely and get some nice gold foil and stuff, and that's beautiful. Um, and even if you're a complete numpty at what you do, you're still going to have a positive effect because there's something called the the Hawthorne effect, which, which indicates that if you're, having, if you're doing a scientific experiment, your performance will naturally increase if you know that you're being observed. And so even if you don't know what you're doing, having a coaching conversation is going to have a positive benefit. But then there are things out there, like um, I saw a conference once, this is a few years ago now, where there was a lady who was saying, did you know that the bumblebee is apparently so heavy that according to the laws of aerodynamics, it should not be able to fly? Well, you know what? No one told the bumblebee, okay? No one told the bumblebee. And people are gonna tell you that you can't fly. Well, I say, you just let your wings shine, okay? You just let your wings shine. Um, and I was just at the, the back of the room um, on my iPad checking my emails, as you do. Um, the person next to me was writing in their notebook, let wings shine. And <laughs> They underlined the word shine three times as though it would be a useful strategy to refer to when motivation was low. Meanwhile, I just Googled bumblebees and flight, and in about 0.36 seconds found out that the way that bumblebees' wings are arranged have manifolds that create these mini cyclones which help keep them aloft despite their volume to weight ratio. Um, what I'm suggesting here is there is, a, there is like a scientific reason for this, or at least there's an avenue for us to apply some curios curiosity to what we're actually observing. But the world is fraught with these quick fixes, these defaults when it comes to motivational advice. Just look at your Facebook feed. All of us have a friend that posts images of people with silhouettes talking about success or, you know, sun, uh, you know, everything is beautiful and stuff. And it is, and it's lovely. But we have to go a little bit deeper sometimes. We have to go a 
bit beyond the convenient motivational throwaway cliche lines when it comes to how we progress this meaningful work. But then there are things on the other side of the equation, on the other side, people fixate upon the, the, the goal that we're going towards. Who here has endured a presentation on smart goal setting before? Yes, yes, right. No, it's not terribly exciting, is it? It's fine if you're, if you're doing formulaic work with predictable outcomes, but in a creative sense, if we're building for the future of work, smart goals can be horrendous. There's a wonderful paper by the Harvard Business Review about goals gone wild, the systemic effects of overprescription of goal setting. Goals narrow our focus. We fixate upon one destination in the future which robs us of our ability to uh, explore tangential opportunities along the way. Uh, it, goals also encourage much more myopic behaviour, so we, we're, we're more fixated upon short-term wins than we are the distant purpose that we're serving. And it, there's research that suggests that its goals lead to more unethical behaviour in how we pursue things. This leads us with a perplexing question. How is it that we motivate people to do great work? How do we get motivated and sustain that motivation to do the great work that leads us further towards relevance? There was an interesting thing, a uh, question that was asked of over 600 managers, and it has a lot of relevance to us today, and asked this very question, what is it that gets people motivated to do this great work? They were given a bunch of good answers to choose from, distilled down from various meta-analyses. I'm going to call out these answers, and there's five different ones, I'm going to repeat the list twice, and then you're sitting next to someone who could be your BFF, or at least your temporary best friend forever. Um, and I'm going to get you to mumble to that person what you think the number one thing is out of this list that I share. Um, don't say it too clearly in case you get it wrong, but um, here we go. Uh, recognition for good work, interpersonal support, clear goals and targets, a clear sense of progress, or incentives and rewards. Incentives and rewards, a clear sense of progress, interpersonal support, clear goals and targets, or recognition for good work. Which one is it? I'm going to give you about five seconds to have a chat with the person next to you. Let's go. And magic. There you go. Extroverts, a little bit of um, interactivity for you. <laughs> and introverts, we resume normal programming. Um, <coughs> So the correct answer is, of course, it depends. Um, but what the research has found uh, is recognition for good work came out as number one, which is a really good answer. What it doesn't mean, if you're in an um, organizational context, it doesn't mean you know, just completing the second half of your feedback sandwich, where you say something nice about someone you know, and then give them a whole bunch of crappy feedback laced with personal attacks, and then, and, and then another wafer-thin acknowledgement about something they did a while ago and see you again in six months. It's not that. It's providing feedback proximal to when you see it manifesting. So if you see something that's really good, you recognize it and you, you share them. It's a good answer. What the researchers thought might be quite novel, though, is um, asking the employees. They thought, well, why don't we actually ask the employees themselves what is it that contributes to the highest levels of motivation to do this great work? And so they followed a bunch of employees over several years, analysing over 12,000 journal entries to see what correlated. Turns out what came out as number one is what the managers ranked as dead last. And that is a clear sense of progress. A clear sense of progress. This became the number one breakthrough idea from the Harvard Business Review in 2010, and it's still something that many organizations, many individuals, aren't necessarily tapping into as much as they can. What this means is it's much more about celebrating small wins, short-circuiting feedback loops, or reducing the latency between effort and meaningful feedback than it is about fixating upon distant goals and targets or incentivizing those or visualizing where we could go and that success. It's much more about celebrating these small wins along the way. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here so we can really get this because this is incredibly powerful. Um, imagine earlier in your career, you're working for someone and a different boss because you're not freelancing or whatever, you're actually working for someone. And that person says to you, I, I need you to do this special report. I've got some people coming from overseas. It's very important. I need you to get this report to me by Monday morning. And you're terrible at saying no, so you say yes, and you cancel um, cupcakes with friends on the weekend, or what do we do here? Um, 
cinnamon buns stuff. Yeah, cinnamon buns. Yeah, yeah, cool. We cancel cancel cinnamon buns and. Um, and you work really hard on this report. You, you, you spend a lot of the weekend, you check your references, you have it formatted beautifully. Monday morning comes, it's submitted by 8 a.m. Uh, and then you hear nothing back. And you get a little bit worried, but then uh, Tuesday comes um, and you think, still haven't heard anything back. So you send another email saying, oh, just sending this report, just checking you, you got it okay and reattaching it here. Wednesday comes, still haven't heard anything. Thursday comes, you start work, you open up your computer, and you're greeted to an email that says, thanks, turns out I didn't need it. <laughs> and what we learn in that moment is, should a similar request come about again in the future, it's much more likely that we're going to default to a conservative level of effort, because we just don't know if it's going to go anywhere. We don't know if it's worth our, in our investment of time. It's an intelligent form of laziness. We have a finite amount of time, energy, and attention available to us each day. It makes sense that we invested into the things that provide the richest sense of progress. Now, I love the progress principle. I think it's, it's absolutely wonderful, but this too can be broken. Some of the things that provide us with the richest sense of progress are the default things that we're very, very familiar with. Think about it. If you're in angst about the direction of something that hasn't been done before, if you're in the space of doing pioneering work, work that is unprecedented, work that is delving into uncertainty and the complexity of the ambu ambiguity of the uncertain future, then it's very hard to get a sense of progress. And so what we find ourselves doing is things like checking email, because email provides such a rich sense of progress. You start your day with 98 emails in your inbox, an hour later you've got it down to 24. It feels like you're winning, right? You're, you're like just an email ninja, you get in there and you smash it, and you're, you're, you're making progress. Um, if that doesn't happen, I do this thing where sometimes I'll geometrically align things. I'm not even going to attempt this. Um, but, you know, I'll shift objects until they're nice and neatly arranged. And that gives me a sense of progress. I have a friend who procrastinates, um, so she'll bake stuff as a form of procrastination. Um, and I know that many of us, when it comes to writing down lists of things to do, will write down things that we've already done, just so that we can tick it off and get that sense of progress. We love seeing progress. We love knowing that our effort contributes to progress. Um, who here um, runs like every morning? Yeah, yeah, cool, good -o. Um I wish I had that thing going on. Um, I have friends who run every day, and um, you know, one of them says to me that if they don't get their run in, it feels like they're missing something. Their day is just not the same. And I wish I just had that imbalance going on. Um, I use apps to help me stay motivated to do things like activity. I use an app called RunKeeper, which tells you how fast, how frequent, how far you run. Um, sometimes pair that with Zombies Run, which makes you feel like you're being chased by zombies. Um, and that motivates me to run because there's that clear feedback loop. Now, there are ways that we can design our work to give us a clear sense of progress in the things that matter. What I'd like you to do at the moment, just one other activity. There's probably two more activities, little, little minor, mild activities with your BFF. Is I'd like you to think about in your work, in your day-to-day, -day, whether you're freelance or you're working in a large organization, what are the activities that you do that provide you with a rich sense of progress? I'm going to give you about one minute to do this, little, little chat, and uh, then I'll take it from there. So one minute, let's go. And about 15 seconds. And 
Magic. Good -o. Now here's the question to ask ourselves. If we're going to liberate ourselves from this broken state of motivation and of our own defaulting to progress feedback loops, the question is, whatever you talked about then, is this meaningful progress? Or are we indulging in a rich delusion of progress? Because what happens in many of our days is we tap into a delusion of progress because it feels wonderful. We're productive. We're getting things done. And we have these days where we tick all the right boxes, we answer our emails and we do things, and yet we're not making meaningful progress. We're not disrupting the patterns that are forming. We're simply perpetuating them. This question, is this meaningful progress, is one of the most important questions we can ask at any point in time. And yet, we get lost in the busyness. We get lost in the sea of, of efficiency and the curse of efficiency, and we end up getting busy, running around, doing a lot of stuff, but not necessarily making any progress. And so if we're, not if we're not finding a sense of progress in the work that we're doing, many of us will find ourselves playing Candy Crush or Bejeweled or iPhone games because that will provide a rich sense of progress, but that is clearly not a meaningful sense of progress. And so I'd like to give you one little practical thing from a little um, perspective of motivation, strategy, and design that might help us to tap into meaningful progress, to liberate ourselves from the broken nature of motivation and design it in a way that's useful for us. So this is something, um, I, I, it's one of my favorite models that I've, I've kind of cobbled together, inspired by a lot of other different um, wonderful experts. Uh, and it comes around this concept of rituals. We need to foster rituals, these deliberate sacred routines that we have that deliberately carve out time against the grain of busyness so that we can progress the things that matter most, so that we can ask the bigger questions. If we don't have rituals that disrupt the flow of busyness, we end up just perpetuating a lot of the default. So there's a model coming up. I'm hoping it's going to come up and display well for you. I'll pace us through this, and I'll give you some context. So on the left-hand side here, we have specificity. And on the right-hand side, we have fuzziness. And this extends through different time periods. It's almost like Google Earth. You start off at street view, then you have suburb view, then city view, then state view, then country view, then planet view. It's like that with time, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, and decade and beyond. Each time signature or time frequency, there are different rituals that we can tap into. So for example, at the daily level, I mean, it's okay if you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years' time. That's fine. I can't stand it when motivational speakers tell um, high school students they need to know exactly where they want to be in 10 years. I don't know why I always default to a corny American accent. Sorry about that. But um, where you want to be in 10 years' time, I should try to mix it up. Um, Irish accent, or I don't know. Um, it, but, but if, like my parents at the moment, uh, they have a caravan, like a like a thing that they tow on the back of their car. It's a very Australian thing to do when you reach a certain age. And they go around Australia with a caravan. And I remember a phone call where my mum was telling me in rather exacting detail where they're going to park the caravan in two years' time when they come to visit me. That's a level of detail I just don't need until maybe the day before. Um, <laughs> But when it comes to us thinking about what are the things that will, will create the most meaningful progress, I hope that we can be very specific when it comes to what you can do today that will create meaningful progress, what we can do tomorrow that will create meaningful progress. And this has helped if we have a meta-morning ritual, something I like to think of as a meta-morning ritual. It can take five to ten minutes with a cup of tea or a coffee in the morning. This is where we do three things. Before we check our email. I, I used to go to bed with my phone by my bedside table, and when the alarm would go off, I'd be checking email within seconds, and it's a horrendous day, way to start your day. Like It just sets you up for reactive work. You're responding to other people's urgencies rather than progressing what's important to you. So before you check email, like put your phone away from your bedside table. Before you check email, do this thing where, number one, you identify what three things you can do today that will contribute the most meaningful progress. And you make sure these three things are tickable, crisp and tickable, not vague things like think about this or learn how to do this, actual crisp, tickable actions. The next thing you do is you feed your curiosity. We all 
have an information diet. Uh, many of us by default, many of us consume information via mainstream media, but we can curate it. There are wonderful apps that allow you to aggregate what's happened in the internet for the last 24 hours and deliver stuff for you relevant to your field of interest. If you have a broad field of interest, you'll be kept up to date with new thinking in this space, which will influence the conversations you have in your day. So that's a very handy thing. The third thing is to look at these three things that you've identified, the three things that will give you meaningful progress, and then work out how can you be true before 2? How can you be true to these three things before 2 p.m.? Because the default many people have is to hope that they'll have time to get around to it once they've cleared out the email and done other work. But instead, we want to be strategic. How do we get these, two, uh, these three things happening before 2 p.m.? That's a meta-morning ritual. There are other things you can do in your day. Daily gratitudes is, uh, there's a whole heap of research that suggests that gratitude journaling is an effective thing to do. My, uh, my wonderful wife um, and I, Kim, Kim's in the room. I think she's in the room. Anyway, huge. she's a big fan, big fan of my work. Um, <laughs> um, yes, she's right at the back. Good. Um, we had this, uh, this gratitudes ritual thing going on where we'd have it written in the book and... Um, Kim would be so good at writing her gratitudes in a book and she'd be all, like, at, at the end of the day, be in bed and she'd be writing her gratitudes and stuff. And I'd be so tired by the end of the day, I'd be like, I have to do these fucking gratitude things and I'd be like, whatever. Um, and I realised after a week that this ritual wasn't working for me. Every week I suggest you have a ritual that identifies friction, something that you have that lets you reflect back on what's working. If you are journaling what your meaningful progress looks like every day and at the end of the week you look back and you think, hang on, every day this week I've tried to do this thing and this thing hasn't been done. The issue is not you, you're not broken. The issue is not your motivation, you want to do this thing. The issue is somehow there's some friction getting in the way between your intention and the desired behaviour manifesting. And if we have some ritual in place that lets us step back and think, hang on, what's getting in the way here? We can deal with that constructively to find other pathways to making, these, making meaningful progress happen. So each week, have an end of the week reflective ritual where you identify friction. If we skip ahead to each quarter here, I suggest every 90 days you choose three meaningful projects to engage in. A uh, good mate of mine back in Australia, Peter Cook, coined the phrase, projects that matter. He says that projects that matter are the only things that matter. I really love this. This idea of projects, they're different to goals. You might have a goal to get fit, a project is to complete a half marathon. You might have a goal to learn how to cook, a project is to host a dinner party. Three meaningful projects. Because uh, then once you have three, as uh, my mate Peter says, you can then actively seek to fail 50% of them. And you deliberately want to do this. Um, you want to fail 50% of your most important projects. The reason being, the opposite of success is not failure, it's apathy. It's the non-doing of things. Very easy to mask apathy with productivity, where we're very productive doing the default things but not making meaningful progress on the things that matter. And besides, in science, there's no, no such thing as failure. There's only disproven hypotheses. The only way you can effectively disprove a hypothesis is by collecting evidence, which means you're doing something. So think about it every quarter. What are your three experiments that matter? What are three things you're going to experiment with this quarter that might lead you to meaningful progress? Then each month you can check with them, see how they're working. Each uh, decade, I don't know if I've been alive enough to know what this ritual is, but I suspect it's something like a sabbatical. Uh, every 10 years, take an extended break from what you're doing just to get some perspective. And each year, you can do this thing that I do where I choose one word for my year, one word to serve as a fuzzy contextual beacon. When you find yourself lost or meandering or off track, this one word can kind of pull you back, towards, uh, back to your intent. Um, it's much better than a very specific goal set, uh, you know, a year into the future. This serves as a, as a, as a beacon. My word uh, a few years ago was kingly, which is all about stepping up and growing the beard and writing my first book. Um, my word last year, because kingly brought a lot of seriousness, uh, my word last year was pirate. It was a year of pirate, which is being a bit more jolly and um, exploring uncharted territory and uh, drinking more rum, looking after my mates, that type of thing. Um, I wonder what your word might be. If you think of your life as an autobiography, and if you lo were looking back on the last 12 chapters of your life right now, reading through the last 12 chapters, 
And if you were to step back, you might pick up a theme going on, a consistent pattern, a default that has formed for you that you may no longer be comfortable with. And if you look back on the last 12 months and you were to think of one word to describe what the last 12 months have been, I wonder what that word might be. For many people, it's busy, it's hectic, it's tumultuous, it's things like that, challenging. But if we look at the blank chapters of the next 12 months, and if you step back and you realize you can choose one word, one word to cast ahead as a fuzzy beacon for your year ahead, I wonder what that word might be. I've given us all a gift for the awkward networking session that happens after this, because now you can ask each other, what might your word be? The key to this is to choose something that's not boring. Don't choose balance or health or happiness, because that's so forgettable. Choose something that's interesting, that has edge. Start with those words, but then go through until you find something that just really resonates for you. Someone once said, oh, I'm not sure what my word is. I think it's focus, but I'm not sure. I said, oh, I'll think about that. Um, <laughs> And then she came back and she said, I found it. My word is hunter. Hunters need to rely on their wits. They need to know what their prey is. They need to be aware of their surroundings. Hunter's my word. And that became a really empowering word for her. I've got a whole raft of examples. But the thing is to find the word that's true for you. Let your friends know so they, they can hold you true to your intention for the year. I was having crepes with some friends or galettes with some friends uh, in Melbourne and um, we had savoury crepes, and then I was tired, like my friends ordered dessert crepes, and I was like, no, I'm going to be good, I'm going to be healthy. Uh, and then um, their crepes came, and it was this nice burnt butter, salted caramel crepes with um, double thickened cream with vanilla beans running through it, it looked divine. And they saw that I liked it, and I was like, oh, why don't you have some? And I'm like, oh no, the kitchen uh, packing up, I don't want to keep you waiting, because I tend to be like, way too polite and considerate. And they said to me, is this what a pirate would do? I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. So I tore off a, like a tiny two centimeter piece of their crepe and I ordered my own crepes and I ate it too. That's the word, and that's the power of the word. Um, there, are, there are things going on here, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up in a tick. Before I do, I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes and then we might have some time for some Q&A, fingers crossed. Um, a couple of quotes here. Uh, the first one is my favorite. I quote this all the time. James Cass, he's the author of Finite and Infinite Games. It's a philosoph uh, philosophical book, uh, a vision of life as play and possibility. He says that finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. The work that you're doing, anyone that engaged in creative work, we're playing with boundaries. We're playing with boundaries to move us beyond the established defaults. That doesn't float your boat. I've got one more quote up my sleeve. Um, this one comes from Andrew Ryan. He's the CEO and founder of Rapture, an underwater city in a game called Bioshock. Um, and he says, we all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us. I'd like to thank you for choosing to come here this morning, for choosing to be part of here. It's not, it's not only shaping who you are, but the wonderful work you do on the, the planet that we're on. Thank you also to Jesper and Creative Mornings. You guys have been great. Thank you. Thanks.